Hello, River of Life. Welcome to our Raw Online. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Wherever you are tuning in, it's wonderful to have you this morning. We've been on a journey uh, as we track with our amazing series, A Lifestyle of Making Disciples, Seven. If you've been tracking with us the last couple of weeks, we've looked at uh, the in the building facets, uh, which is basically small groups, large groups, and generosity, which Scott and Andrew preached so well on. And today we, we, we start looking at the, uh, the world, outside world, and focusing mainly on family, the workplace, and beyond our comfort zone. And then the last one, the last seven, we're going to be looking at the heart, really focusing on the heart, and this is going to be on prayer and word. So it's wonderful that today I'm going to be preaching on family. And I'm so glad that God, right from the beginning, if we read the book of Genesis, you find that God's redemptive plan focuses on family. Family is front and center of God's redemptive plan. That he calls, he made Adam and Eve, and from there he blessed them and said, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the, the cattle, and everything that creeps upon the earth. And right there we see that God begins to outwork his redemptive plan through a family. And later on we see that he calls Abraham and Sarah, and from there he says, You are going to be fathers and mothers to the nations, to the world, from you and through you, I am going to begin my redemptive plan. And we see that as we track with Jacob, with Ruth, with David, right through even when we get to Zechariah and, and, and Elizabeth, the birth of John, it is all in the context of, of, of family. And then we also see Joseph and Mary and Christ being born into that family and we see the humanity of Christ. So right there, Right at the beginning, we see that family is front and center of God's redemptive plan. And even as we look at Jesus' ministry, you would agree with me that at the core face of his ministry, he interacted, he engaged with different families. You would see that he was in Simon Peter's home, where he then prayed for his mother-in-law. We saw that he healed um, Jairus' daughter. He went to his house and laid hands and healed uh, his daughter. So we see that Jesus, even in his, his interaction during his ministry, family was at the core face of what he did. So this morning, I, I, I'm glad that my main aim is really to help us earth out some truth that we are going to see from the book of Timothy, uh, looking mainly at Timothy chapter 1 from verse 8 to verse 11. And from there, I am going to propose three practical applications that will help us to see how we can outwork family in our day-to-day -day life. Shall we turn to the book of Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 8 to 11? It says, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers, the rebels, those that are disobedient, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, sound doctrine, healthy doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God which he entrusted to me. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Thank you, Lord, that as we look at family, that this teaching, Father God, will bring health to our family structures. That this teaching, Father God, who reveal to us the steps, the practical application that we need to involve and to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you that right at the beginning, Father, family is crucial and is important to you. So Holy Spirit, thank you. I pray for every single person under the sound of my voice that they would hear you and connect with you this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So this morning, church, I, I really want to help us uh, unearth three key textual truths from this passage that we've just read from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 to, to 11. And the first truth that we get is that sound teaching leads to heart change expressed in worship to God and witness in the world. Sound teaching leads to heart change expressed in worship to God and witness in the world. 
So we see right there that the word of God challenges us immediately to live a different life in our families, in our homes, and to live differently in the world. This passage really ethics out, if you look at what Paul was talking about, that the law is good, but it is only good to one who really upholds it and does it to the fullest of which it has been prescribed. And the law is not for the righteous, but the law is for the ungodly. It is for those that do not believe. And it actually says that, the, and we understand that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless, the disobedient, the transgressors, for the ungodly and sinners, the unholy, the profane, and those that kill their fathers and mothers. So right there we see that the law, though it be good, if it is not done to the fullest of what God has intended to be, it is pointless, it is useless, and it is not made for the righteous or for the just, but it is for the ungodly so that the law can point them to Christ. Because we know that in Christ, the law is fulfilled. So right there we see the first thing that we see there that is sound doctrine leads to the change, certain change in the heart that results in the worship of God and that is also expressed as a witness to the world. And I can draw your attention to John chapter 4. Um, you can read that from verse, 30, uh, from verse 1 to verse 39. This is Jesus encountering the Samaritan woman. Just to show you what happens, the Samaritan woman came to the world where Jesus was. He was tired, he was thirsty, and when he, she came there, she had an encounter with Jesus. And the encounter is such that Jesus was able to tell her her life to reveal to her the deep secrets of her life. And we notice that right at the end, it says that the woman ran and went to the town. The town was called Sika. And she called all the people in the town and, and said, come and see this man who has told me everything about my life. I'm sure he is a prophet. And the entire town came to Jesus. So her personal experience with Christ in that moment meant that she, she worshipped Jesus. She worshipped God. And that resulted in her witnessing to the world. She ran and went to the city and called everyone. And verse 39 actually said that many came to Jesus and believed in him. So right there we know that sound teaching, which is healthy to our living, healthy to our families, brings about a change in heart, which is expressed in worship to God and witness in the world. The second truth that we have is that Life in the heart determines life in the family or in the home. Life in the home determines life in the world. This is quite important because we realize that right at the beginning, it is almost the same point like the first one that I've just alluded to. But we see that the teaching of true doctrine, the correct exegesis of scripture, and the teaching of the word, when it is received in the heart, it is expressed in our families expressed in our home. And when it is expressed in our home, it can also be experienced in the family. So we see that there's a direct correlation with what happened to correct teaching, sound doctrine that is received in the heart. And when it is received in the heart, it then eschews out and it is experienced and witnessed in how we lead our families. That is a direct correlation that we see from, from the word of God. It is all about the heart. God is really seeking for man's heart. He's really wanting to get to our heart. And we can see that Proverbs 4.23 says that guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flows the issues of life. There was a reason why that was spoken. The heart from the heart is where we get all the issues of life. And I can even draw you again to Matthew chapter 15 from verse 15 to 19 where Jesus had an encounter again with the Pharisees and they asked him, but teacher, why, how can men be defiled? How do men get defiled? And Jesus speaking to them, he said that it is not what goes through the mouth that defiles the men, but what comes out through the mouth, from the recesses of the heart, that is the very thing that defiles the man. And those from the heart, because he says from the heart, from the recesses of the heart, comes things like murder, fornication, adultery, sexual immorality, uh, uh, thinking, jealousy, pride, all these things comes from the heart. And right there, Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, Paul talks about his aim why God has called him. And he actually says now, and he's saying this to, Philip, to, to Timothy, he says, the aim of our charge is that love, that 
issues from your pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So we see that the heart is critical and it is central because we have to guard our heart. So our consciences and everything that we do when we receive the true doctrine of, 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 of Christ, when it is taught to us, when it goes into our heart, it brings a change into the individual and that is reflected into the family and into society as well. The third truth that we get from this passage of scripture that we read is that real relationship with Christ in the family or in the home is the basis for any healing and blessing in society. Breakdown in family result in breakdown in society. The chaos that we see in the world, the, the challenges that we face regarding uh, lack of peace, um, abuse, and the many other things that you can think of are as a result of broken families. People coming from brokenness and leading others into brokenness. Breakdown in family leads to breakdown in society. And we know like what Paul is teaching us in the book of Timothy, that the law is for the ungodly. The law is for the ungodly so that it, po it can point them to Christ. When they receive the true teaching of doctrine of Christ, then they can leave the ravage behind, they can leave sin, and they can receive Christ by faith. And we know that in Christ, the law is fulfilled. Their real relationship with Christ becomes the basis for healing, blessing, and goodness. And apart from that, we still might need the law to challenge us. The law, really, there's no justification that we get from the law. But the law is just like our, our schoolmaster who is pointing us to Christ. And once we receive Christ and we believe in him, we put our trust in him, the law is useless. The law can't bring us into eternal life. But it is by faith, by believing in the works of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love how Scott preached last Sunday, and he gave us an example of Zacchaeus. This was a guy who was working for um, the Roman government, and he was a Jew, but operating on behalf of the Jew, he was a tax collector, and we saw how mean he was, and how he was extorting from his own countrymen. But this is what happened when he had a real relationship, real contact with Christ. His life changed. His heart was touched. And right there we see how healing and how blessing became. So he says to Jesus, half of what I have, I'm going to give to the poor. And everyone that I defrauded, everyone that I took out, everyone that I extorted from, I'm going to repay four times. We see right there when the gospel comes in, when the true teaching, the real experience that he had with Christ, when he came into his home, brought about healing. Because he was not accepted within his own community, within his own society. Because the soul him as one who was uh, hand in glove, hand in hand with the Romans. But we saw immediately when he had that encounter with Jesus that he had to bring healing by saying, I will give my, half of my wealth to the poor and to everyone that I extorted, I will pay for it. And we see that it is done by faith. It is not done by works because the law, we are not justified by the works of the law. And we see that four times in the Bible, Habakkuk 2 verse 4 says that the righteous shall live by faith. Romans 1 verse 16 talks about my, the righteous shall live by faith. We see again in Galatians 3 verse 11, it says the righteous shall live by faith. And in Hebrews 10 38, it says that the, my people, those that I call righteous, shall live by faith. They shall not draw back, but they shall live by faith. So it is by faith that we receive from God and once we receive from Jesus we can also impart that to others like we saw in the life of Zacch Zacchaeus the tax collector life was changed healing came there was blessing within the community because of just how he encountered Jesus so a real relationship with Christ in the family in the home is the basis for any healing and blessing in society so right now church I just want us to cross over and just hear this amazing, beautiful testimony from the Rada Mayors, Leon and Charlie. They're going to be sharing. These are people who are part of our community, a special family that we love. Let us just tune in and hear their testimony regarding family. And then we'll come back and I'll close. Morning, River of Life. It's Leon and Charlie. We are so honored to be sharing with you a little bit about our family. Ella and Levi are probably somewhere trashing up the house, but just a moment to share our hearts with you and a little bit of our lives with you. 
uh, when I've been thinking about family and discipleship, the scripture that I kind of think about and have been meditating on is uh, 1 Corinthians 13, the scriptures about love. Um, and thinking about love and what love looks like. Yeah, when I think about our little family, I think about what a wonderful dad Leon is to our kids. Just how I think in so many ways he reflects the kind of love that we get from our Heavenly Father. He is just such a hands-on dad. He has been involved in every step of our kids' lives um, from the time they were born. He tells them every day how much he loves them and how beautiful they are. I've personally found teaching the kids and being persistent and diligent with the smaller things, reading the Bible, teaching memory verses to be a little harder than probably should be for me. But for Charlie, it's come so naturally. In the last few months, Ella and Levi have memorized four or five memory verses and she just sits there and it's such a natural thing. Um, and you know, when I see that expression of love and discipleship, uh, my role on the other end is just something I love to do and feels easy, easy for me. We've also been quite deliberate and diligent in trying to work on marriage. So um, quite a few years ago, we went to the Christian Counseling Center. We did the marriage course, which I think is about to kick off again. Mm. And just feeding us as a couple, I think is important. Because we are an interracial couple, um, there's definitely moments where we don't agree. I think um, what nice as well with, with the differences, often we converge at the central point that is the gospel. And we often have these conversations in the context of what would it look like if there were no biases or prejudices or, or, or the background context or upbringing. Yeah, we've become very good at um, we'll start talking about something and then we'll try and look at the other perspective <laughs> that we think the other person might have <laughs> and kind of think that through and um, it's really been a very uh, fruitful thing for me. On the extended family, it's been one of the places where I think we've learned to love in a deeper way. You know, there's so many people, so many personalities, so many opinions, so many ideas, yeah. and to love them in whatever circumstance and situation we've found ourselves going into. I feel um, a lot of humility. Like I feel like I'm often humbled because I feel like with your people who are the closest to you is where you tend to be the messiest. And so I often um, think to myself, oh Lord, are we even, are we even shining, you know? <laughs> is there any light here? Particularly with my immediate family, um, I find it the hardest to be the gospel, you know, to my, my most immediate family. But I've just seen God's faithfulness in our relationships. I've seen God's faithfulness in opportunities to be the gospel. I've seen God's faithfulness in just getting back up on the horse and trusting Him that seeds that we plant are are growing um, and opportunities to continue being loved. Coming full circle back to, to 1 Corinthians, you know, that love is patient, love is kind, it's, um, it's not proud, it's not self-seeking, um, and just having that uh, back in the forefront. Wow, what a beautiful testimony from the Radameyers. I love a church where we can be real where we share our own personal life stories that can also impact others. And the word of God that says that um, it is through our testimonies that we can encourage others to Christ. So right now, as we conclude, I would just like to propose to you three practical applications that we can uh, engage with and even start doing within our family. The three are live at peace in our families, live at peace in our marriages, and live at peace in our parenting. The first one, live at peace in our families. Some of the worst conflicts that we have experienced, me included, happens within the family structure, happens within people that are close to, people that you know and love. And it is generally driven because of selfish desires and greed. And we can see that from James chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, it says, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from your evil desires at, at war within you? You want what you don't have? You scheme, you kill, you are jealous of what others have, but you can't get. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are wrong. 
You want only what will give you pleasure. So right there we see James telling us that we, because of wrong motives, it brings conflict, it brings hatred, it brings division, it brings so much pain. And this is what we experience. But the word of God is really encouraging us to move away from selfish ambition, selfish pleasure, to focus on others, to live our life, our lives as a sacrifice to others and not only to ourselves. The conflicts in our own families can end in hatred, like I've said. There's distance, there's pain, there's dislocation and even murder. But we know that the word of God again encourages us in Romans chapter 12, verse 18. It says that whatever you can do, whatever you can do, everything by living in peace with all men. We are being called to live in peace even in our families, to be at peace with our family members, to bring healing, to bring forgiveness so that we can be at peace. And sometimes I know that there could be irreparable damages but I think the encouragement there is that we are being called to possibly express forgiveness, to express grace, to express the kingdom of God in our families. The second thing that we have, the second practical application is live at peace in our marriages. This one is a big one. Sexual purity, sexual integrity, commitment of, of, of sexual faithfulness to a single spouse for all of our life is the bedrock for sound, for strong and victorious marriages. Without that, without faithfulness in our marriages, we cannot have strong and victorious marriages. And we know that marriage reflects or preaches Christ and what he did for the church. That he laid down his life and he died for the church. He was without no sin, he committed no sin, he knew no sin. But because of the love that the Father had for us, Christ had to die for us. And in marriage, we see that. It paints that picture of us men laying down our lives for our wives, being faithful to our wives. One woman, not this whole small house thing. We need to stop that rubbish because that does not reflect who Christ is and what he did for us. And we know that I've been privileged of late. I've done a couple of weddings since December into this new year. And one of the most striking things that I love is that when we do have the exchange of vows, it actually says, to you only, and it says, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. It is to you only. That is the heart of the marriage vows or promises that the bride and the groom exchanges. The heart of it is staying faithful to those vows. And that's what Christ did. Christ was faithful that he did not neglect the cross. He did not say, Father, I can't do this. But he went to the cross so that you and me could receive salvation through the work that he did. So we want to be a church that honors marriages, singles that are faithful in their sexuality. You are doing this not when you step into marriage, but even before you are waiting for your future spouse, and you are caring for yourself. That is what God is calling us to. And I love the fact that we have got a course that is starting, the marriage course, and many of you have signed up. And I believe that course is going to bring transformation, it's going to bring healing, it's going to change our marriages. We want to invest in our marriages so that we can live at peace in our marriages. And the last one that we're going to look at uh, this morning is live at peace in our parenting. That is also critical, believers. Church, we are being called that instead of killing, like what we see the ungodly do, killing fathers and mothers, bringing hurt and pain within the home, children, this is for us, to obey our parents. Because the Bible says, honor your father and mother to build the glory of the blessed God through the gospel in our families as we parent. And that would reflect and influence society as well. So essentially, when we spell love, we should spell it T-I-M-E. That is time. God is calling us to take time to build relationship with our children, to build relationship with our family members, with one another, in the home, in the family. That is what God is calling us to. And it's not just about preaching sermons, and but it is really outworking this truth that we have received, this sound doctrine in our own families, really having a one-on-one -on -one with our families. Like what Paul says, be imitators of God 
If we are imitators of Christ, then we should reflect how Christ had those one-on-one, -on -one, those intimate moments. He's calling us fathers to spend time with our children. He's calling us mothers to nurture our kids, to care for them, to point them, to support them, to affirm them, to show them the way. That is what God is calling us to, to parent in a godly way. And just this past week, we, were, we, we went to a funeral and I had an amazing testimony of a father who cared and looked after a young, a young man. Um, he didn't know his father, but because he was friends with, uh, uh, with, with the son of this man, the father was able to speak into this man's life to the extent that the father, his real father, didn't have impact or had nothing to do with his life, but another man stood in his place and became his father. And he's grown up, and right now he's, he's part of the leadership team in one of uh, a great church in Harare. It was because of a father who stepped into that role and helped parent that young man to become a solid young man, founded on the truth, loving his wife and loving his family, and he's reflecting the same thing to his kids. And that is what God is calling us. I also heard another story from my good friend, a lawyer who worked so hard his entire life. When he passed away, there were so many great men and women who came and said, this man was a great man. He did a lot for us, but his own children said, we didn't know our father because he was never there. He spent most of the time with different people. I think all these people that are here were closer to him than he was to us. He had a high profile, but yet he had no impact to his children. So how we parent our children now will reflect in years to come if we have done a good job. Recently, we've, there's amazing UNICEF surveys that, that have come out, the research that UNICEF has done, and it says that at grade two, it has become an absolute crucial stage for children where they move from learning to read to reading to learn. Therefore, the child can, if the child is emotional, is secure emotion, emotionally, socially, physically, um, if he's cared for during that critical stage in their life, they are on the highway, the highway track to gain the best in their education and in their life. If there's a gap in there, you, it will actually reflect even as they proceed with their education and their life. And again, grade four, 80% of what happens in grade four, what happens in this critical stage is critical and important and it is reflected in how they do when they are in grade seven. These early years, these early days become crucial building blocks to, to strengthen the future and to avoid pitfalls. And that is what God is calling us, to reflect his kingdom through how we live at peace in our families, to live at peace in our marriages, and to live at peace in our parenting. It is important. As we look at this amazing series, The Lifestyle of Making Disciples, it begins with you, it begins with, with me, in our homes, in our families. And everything that we are talking about, the in the building facets, small groups, the large group, giving group, or generosity, it is expressed primarily in the home and then it is outworked into all these other facets. So if we miss it right at the beginning, we will not get it right even as we proceed. So just as I close, I just want to encourage you this morning that God is calling us to lead godly families, not modern families. Godly families. Modern families that look all good, say the right thing, but they are not really reflecting the life of Christ. We want godly families that can impact society, that can impact nations, that can impact the entire world by how we reflect Christ in this. And I'm going to end with an amazing scripture from Ephesians chapter 3, which Apostle Paul, um, in his letter to the church at Ephesus, um, I'm going to read from chapter 3, verse 14. It says, For this reason... I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. That is my prayer to us, church, this morning, that as we reflect on this message, as we relive our lives, 
Let our lives in our families reflect Christ. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you this morning that you have spoken to us. You have encouraged us, Father God, to live right. That, Father, we commit every family before you, Lord. We pray where there's brokenness that you bring healing. Where there's distance, Father God, that you bring closeness. Where, Father God, there is hurt, that you bring, Father God, peace. We pray, Lord God, that families would reflect Christ in everything that they do. Thank you that families are front and center of your redemptive plan. I praise you and I thank you for the amazing testimonies, oh God, that we will hear in days to come. That certainly, God, you are at work in our families to the glory of your name. We praise you and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Trust that God has blessed you. Have a wonderful day and have a fantastic working week. God bless you.